Good morning. Um, I thank the organizers for their yearly effort and also for inviting me uh, to participate in this. This is a slightly provocative title, just to catch your attention. I have been sort of, it's based on some work I've been doing recently with students. And, uh, and I, you know, it, it sort of bothers me more than uh, it bothers other people. So I thought once again, you know, uh, it's not that I'm going to question, you know, universality. I'm just going to say that, you know, probably at the end of the talk that we need to understand universality a little bit better. So uh, this idea of universality is sort of nearly, you know, 50 years old. It dates back, you know, almost to the time when the organization group theory of critical phenomena was emerging. And what it says in simplest form is that the, you know, if you have uh, an, if you have, uh, just give me a minute to get this. What do I do just to get the pointer? Yeah. If you have a classical n vector spins on a d dimensional lattice with nearest neighbor interactions, then the critical exponents only depend upon n and d okay? and nothing else. For example, I mean, if uh, we believe that the critical behavior of Ising model will be the same on a honeycomb, square, or triangular lattice, because all these three lattices, they are all embedded in two dimensional space. And therefore, critical exponents will be the same. So there is no rigorous proof of this, but the renormalization group offers an intuitively appealing explanation based on the fact that this critical phenomena is caused by a diverging correlation length. So the only relevant things are things that survive under pore screening. Uh, so what I would like to sort of say in this talk is that, uh, you know, recently things that I have been uh, looking at, there is a second order phase transition where the coordination number Z seems to play a role much more important than uh, dimension. And then the lower, there appears to be something like a lower critical coordination number rather than lower critical dimension. But uh, it, it, it's, a, you know, it's a little bit more sort of, there is a twist in that argument. But before that, you know, when I was sort of, about you know, 50 years ago, when I was looking for a PhD problem, you know, the normalization group was just emerging. There was another beautiful problem. You know, the problem of electron localization was, had been solved exactly. Even now, that's the only exact solution available on a Bethel lattice. And, uh, you know, the equations were very complicated. The equations that sort of determine the criteria for localization were very complicated. And people were sort of simplifying those equations and trying to study how does that, uh, you know, how does the uh, you know, coordination number of a Bethel lattice uh, you know, depends, uh, affects the localization. And somehow, you know, that problem was never settled and, uh, you know, just, it was just abandoned. So those of you who are interested in it, I mean, this is a very old article around my PhD days. Still, I think I better not use this. No, but then how could I advance? So, uh, so these, you know, we came to believe so much in universality that anything which was not universal like critical temperature of model, like exact sort of critical disorder where electrons got localized, or the, you know, lattice uh, coordination number, they were uh, abandoned. Uh, time is short, otherwise there is much more to, you know, uh, universality than this. For example, even in my own thesis, you know, I, I showed that not only the renormation group, uh, you know, showed that the uh, exponents were uh, unaffected by several details of the Hamiltonian. They were also unaffected by the way you set up a denomination group, you know, cutoff functions and things like that. So the uh, phase transition, the second order phase transition I'm going to talk about, uh, you know, which I've been working on for several years with many colleagues and students, is looking at critical hysteresis in the random fieldizing model. So you have you have this Hamiltonian with a random field here. Random field has average value zero. It's a Gaussian with standard deviation sigma. I start with all the spins down, use t equal to zero global dynamics to obtain magnetization. And the question is, does the magnetization go smoothly from minus one to plus one, or does it have a discontinuity? Okay. 
And it turns out that there is a critical value of sigma, sigma being the you know, standard deviation of the Gaussian random field, that when sigma goes to zero, I mean, it just jumps sharply from minus one to plus one. As sigma increases, the jump size reduces. And eventually, at sigma equal to sigma c, there is a critical point phenomena very similar to the critical point uh, you know, phenomena I've seen in equilibrium and vector models, or let's say equilibriumizing model. And above that, the uh, magnetization is smooth. So this, this thing, sigma c at c, is a non-equilibrium critical point with critical behavior very similar to the uh, equilibrium uh, critical behavior of icing model. Now, what surprising thing here is that uh, whenever you have a jump in magnetization, these things are very hard to see numerically or even experimentally. There are a lot of fluctuations at that point. So uh, fortunately, uh, you know, things can be solved in the Bethel lattice. So many of these results are exactly exact solutions of Bethel lattice. And then there is some uh, thing about sort of uh, periodic lattices that I will refer to in the last slide, which is very interesting. The first surprising thing is that no phase transition takes place if the coordination number of Bethel lattice is less than three. On periodic lattices also, uh, no phase transition takes place if the coordination number is less than three, irrespective of dimensionality of space in which the lattice is embedded. One can artificially create lattices. Uh, Sanjeev here has done this work for his thesis, and you can sort of create uh, lattices, uh, you know, which, are, which have coordination number three, but the dimensionality of space in which they are embedded can be, you know, three or four or five. And you find that there is you know, no, no jump in magnetization, no critical point. Then uh, recently, you know, I did a calculation. I have a Bethel lattice. So here it, it, it seemed that the, uh, the coordination number uh, four played the role of a minimum uh, you know, um, lower critical dimension. That it was necessary to have z equal to four to have this critical point. Uh, but then, you know, then other things that I'm not referring to, that was not very clear. That's the only criteria. So I did the calculation on a mixed Bethel lattice with a student. This Bethel lattice only has either sort of z equal to 4 or z equal to 3. And surprisingly, it turned out that it has uh, a critical point for arbitrarily small fraction of z equal to 4 sites. So I didn't have to have a lattice you know, with z equal to four, z equal to three lattice. As as soon as you know, there was sort of small, arbitrary small fraction of z equal to four sites. There was uh, this critical point, uh, you know, emerged. Then one other calculation did on a randomly diluted z equal to four lattice. So in this lattice, I only have sort of uh, lattice sites that have coordination three or four. Here it's a randomly diluted z equal to four Bethel lattice. So there are sites which are isolated, which are not coordinated with anybody else. The sites with coordinated with one, two, three, four. Then I found that these are all exact solutions. I found that uh, you know phase transition occurs only when the fraction of z four sites is greater than about 0.55. Okay, this is an exact number that I'll tell you. So the question is, why does this happen? And uh, all the time, you know, this problem was difficult and I didn't understand it because I was trying to think in, in terms of global things. Like, you know, uh, I was used to thinking, you know, critical exponents will depend only on n or dimensionality d. So here also I was thinking that z has to be same throughout the lattice. I have only two minutes left, so I'll like you to read this rather than sort of go through it in detail. Uh, so the, uh, the bottom line is the uh, following, that you have to sort of uh, here in this problem, uh, an avalanche, when the magnetization has a jump, that means uh, a macroscopic fraction of spins uh, turn themselves up, okay, at the same field. So this is what I called an infinite avalanche. And this infinite avalanche has a path, 
And uh, the path, of course, it has to be spanning path if it's an infinitive launch. But on the spanning path, it's just not enough to have a spanning path. You, ha you should have an arbitrarily small fraction of sites on this path occupied by four coordinated uh, sites. So this, you know, one doesn't think of such a local thing, you know, in sort of determining the criteria for uh, a critical point. Uh, I want to come, uh, these things I've talked at some time. What has happened? This doesn't seem to advance. Uh, you want to change? I want to change the next slides. Uh, so again, uh, what I wanted to emphasize here that the phase transition, although it's second order, but it almost looks like first order. I mean, even numerically, you know, it's a, it, there is a jump from here to there, which is uh, in experiments, all these would look like sort of second order uh, phase transitions. This is on the uh, uh, that equal to four Bethel lattice. The transition very sharp. I mean, this C, uh, you know, I'll give you an exact expression for this. Uh, C is 0.557. So at 0.556, you know, you have a smooth magnetization. At 0.558, you have a jump here. Now, uh, okay. This, uh, if somebody is interested, I'll explain it later in detail. I mean, normally when you look at uh, critical point phenomena, there is a fixed point in four dimensions. The fixed point is a trivial fixed point. As you go for minus epsilon, it shifts, you know, and, the, you know, relevant eigenvalues are non-trivial. Here, uh, you always have uh, a fixed point uh, because there is always hysteresis. You know, you starting with initial state and the system remembers where you're coming from from, and uh, when there is a jump, there are, that fixed point splits into two, two fixed points. As I say, I have been sort of, this has been bothering me for quite some time, not as much as it has bothered others, but recently I was very, uh, you know, surprised that somebody took me seriously, and these guys, they are sort of, uh, they do, you know, big, you know, numerical simulations, and they are the people who had shown that the square lattice has a jump. Earlier, that question would not be settled in spite of so many papers. So they repeated this calculation. I, you know, in, in one of the papers that I did not show here, you know, I had said that you know there is a phase transition, there is a jump on a triangular lattice. There is also a jump on a square lattice. As you dilute the triangular lattice, you can go from triangular lattice to you know z equal to three, you know, honeycomb lattice. Uh, continuously, and I said the jump disappears as you do this. So they did this uh, calculation, and they find that not only yeah, there is a you know a phase transition on a triangular lattice, and there is a phase transition on the square lattice, but to the best of their estimates, the critical exponents on these two things are different. So this sort of some cause to you know to sort of understand universality of critical exponents better. Why is it that you know in two dimensions critical exponents have one set you know for uh, square lattice another set for triangular lattice? Thank you. Questions? That is uh, an approximate renormalization group, or you can do something better than that. No, what I alluded to was, I mean, although I'm talking about non-equilibrium critical point, but there are some renormalization group arguments that say that it is in the same universality class. The zero temperature non-equilibrium critical point is in the same universality class as the regular uh, thermal Ising model. So whatever sort of notions of universality I have there should apply here also. And therefore this violation is, you know, uh, I think should be looked at. It is Any other questions? If not, let's thank our speaker again okay. and